Good afternoon. This is February 21st. Uh, it's about 6 p.m. Uh, this evening. And I was blessed this afternoon upon leaving Dayton, Ohio for a conference and visiting with family to be invited by two friends of mine, uh, a brother and sister, uh, to stop by Covington uh, to be interviewed by a local TV station, Channel 9 WCPO. We met in the park there at 11th and Greenup in Covington. And about uh, 1.30, uh, we spent about a half hour, maybe 45 minutes being interviewed. And then the, the interviews, three of us, were of course reduced down to about a minute and a half for the um, five o'clock news. And I uh, came home to watch that and to record that. That was kind of like surprising that my comments were cut out entirely. Uh, I called it a uh, means of whitewashing. So anyway, I am kind of reenacting, if you will, this video to uh, uh, recant uh, uh, my interview with my, again, two dear friends there in Covington. So this is like uh, my attempts to reenact this interview that I thought put a different spin on this question of Juneteenth. The interview, again, was about... Um, the city of Covington had recently passed some type of resolution uh, recognizing Juneteenth and I guess declaring it a local or city holiday. And uh, they were interviewing people to see, get people's reflections and responses to this proclamation. Oh, thank you. My name is Jim Embry and uh, my name is spelled J-I-M. Embry, E-M-B-R-Y. And yes, as you uh, had mentioned, I was uh, grew up here in uh, Covington. I went to school at the historic Lincoln Grant School uh, during the years of segregation. And then I, uh, while I was living here, my mother uh, in 1959 up to the mid 60s was the president of CORE, which is the Congress of Race Equality. And my brother and I, were actually members of CORE. I was 10 years old, my brother 13. So we were on picket lines and demonstrations and we also did wade-ins at the what's called the Rosedale Pool. And we kind of opened up, if you will, uh, the city of Lexington during these years of integration. So uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like, you know, for me, a blessing to have been involved in the civil rights movement some 60 years ago and to now be asked uh, to comment and reflect on uh, this new uh, city government proclamation around Juneteenth. Now, when I was in high school, I was the local president for the youth chapter for the NAACP, as well as the state uh, chairman, state president for the state youth chapter. And my last year of, um, of high school, I was actually a member of the Covington, uh, they call it the Open Housing Commission. And our job was to write uh, wording uh, for a new ordinance declaring that our city would now uh, uh, get rid of the segregated housing policies. And it was the, uh, the responsibility and, and it would be you know, against city policy uh, to no longer to have segregated housing. So it's called the Open Housing Ordinance. So for me, again, it's a blessing to be here today, uh, interviewed by you uh, about Juneteenth, uh, when I was involved again 60 years ago in a similar kind of a proclamation that for me is about this idea of how do we perfect the democracy. So our work in the civil rights movement was about trying to get us as a nation to honor those words in the Declaration, in the Constitution, and to keep furthering democracy. And so Juneteenth, in my view, uh, one of the pieces of Juneteenth is that it is a way, a methodology of perfecting the democracy. However, I have a kind of a different view uh, of Juneteenth than most people. Uh, partly because, uh, you know, I had in my family three great-grandfathers 
that fought in the Civil War uh, on the Union side, <laughs> uh, fighting against the South of the Confederacy. So if we remember, um, Frederick Douglass had encouraged Lincoln back when the war started to allow black folks to fight in the Civil War and to fight for our freedom. But Lincoln had declined uh, Douglass's encouragement. But in 1864, uh, when the North was losing the war, let's be clear, when the North was losing the war against the Confederacy, then Lincoln had a change of heart. And he issued then, as we know, an executive order uh, declaring that it was okay, it was legal, it was important that, um, uh, that we open up uh, the Union Army to African-American soldiers. So uh, during that time period, uh, some 200,000 African-American men and women, men and women joined on the Union Army and in Kentucky, some 28,000 black men and women joined what was called the US Colored Troops to fight in the Civil War. Now, before I go on and talk about Juneteenth, let me back up a minute to say that during our Revolutionary War, according to the history, the first person to die on behalf of Revolutionary War was Crispus Attucks at the Boston Massacre. So we remember that during that Revolutionary War, again, there were black men and black women who were fighting on the front lines, who were helping uh, grow food for the soldiers, were helping with provisions, and were part of the war effort. So July 4th, of course, we celebrate as that conclusion of what's called the War for Independence. So we celebrate July 4th as a War of Independence. Now, I maintain that Juneteenth is not simply a holiday or time of recognition for the emancipation of enslaved Africans, but Juneteenth should also be celebrated by the entire country because the Civil War was the war for reunification. And it was the introduction, again, of some 200,000 plus black men and women, because we remember that Harriet Tubman, Moses of her people, was a spy for the Union Army. And when the war ended, she also uh, was able to get a pension for her war effort. And some black women actually disguised themselves as men to fight in the war. So my main position is, is that as we celebrate July 4th as a war of independence, we should also celebrate Juneteenth, yes, as that announcement, okay, about uh, all Africans who were enslaved are now free. Yes, it should be that, but it should be celebrated as the entire country as the war of reunification. And if it had not been, if it had not been for these 200,000 black men and women fighting in the war, then we wouldn't be unified as a country. What would it look like if the South had won the war? If the Confederacy had continued and moved even further out West, we might be something like North Korea, South Korea. We might be like it was before in East Germany, West Germany, with a wall between the countries. That's how we might have been. But thankfully, we're not like that. Okay, and again, uh, as a country, we have not celebrated the fact, again, and yes, there were white people, black people, as well as Native Americans, uh, you know, fighting in the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, but we don't really honor the Civil War ending as a point of celebration. And in my view, the Civil War and how it turned out was one of the most significant 
occurrences in our nation's history. Yes, of course, the War of Independence was significant as the founding of the country, but the second most important historical occurrence was a civil war ending unifying the country. But we don't celebrate that. I think partly because if you celebrated that, you would truly have to honor, <laughs> you'd have to honor these black men and women, many who died, that made the war end the way it did. So now going back to the Civil War and Juneteenth, I mentioned before that in my family, we have three great grandfathers that fought the US color troops here in Kentucky. One of those grandfathers named George Ballou, he was a member of what's called the 114th Regiment out of Camp Nelson. That's a regiment along with other Union Army regiments that kicked Lee's butt in Virginia. He was surrounded, he was quartered, because now remember, General Lee was regarded as one of America's foremost military tacticians. He is still studied at West, at West Point at the military academies. However, these brave, dynamic, uh, uh, you know, uh, hard fighting, again, black men and women uh, outmaneuvered General Lee in Virginia, surrounded him and forced his surrender. So our great grandfather, George Ballou, was part of that regiment. What that means is that when General Grant accepted General Lee's surrender at Appomattox, our great grandfather was there at Appomattox. That same regiment, 114th Regiment, with a few other US Colored Troop regiments uh, were sent to Texas. Again, the surrender occurred in April, and a week or two after that surrender, uh, the, uh, the uh, General uh, Grant uh, recognized that there were still Confederate uh, battalions still fighting in Texas. So they sent then 10,000 members of the U.S. Colored Troops to get on a boat somewhere there, probably in, in Annapolis or Charleston, and they sailed around the Gulf and came to Charleston, I'm sorry, Galveston, Texas, and they had, um, I think, two things to do. One was to, uh, again, uh, skirmish, have battles with the remaining Confederate uh, Army troops uh, in Texas. And to also, they went there to also secure the border between the USA and Mexico. So can you imagine what it looked like in Galveston, Texas, when these 10,000 Black soldiers came off the boats and began marching through Galveston. Their very presence proclaimed to African Americans that, hey, y'all free. Uh, we had two years ago Emancipation Proclamation, uh, but the war has ended. We defeated Lee, and, and now the proclamation can really take place. Uh, and, and, and you, my black brothers and sisters, y'all are free. They were also saying to white people, okay? <laughs> now y'all thought y'all was gonna keep oppressing, enslaving, exploiting uh, 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 these African people. That's also over with. So my position is that General Granger wasn't one we should give full credit for, for issuing this proclamation in June in Galveston, we should give more credit to these 10,000 black soldiers who came into Texas, defeated in a few battles, the Confederate armies, and then came in and, and like pretty much occupied Galveston, occupied Texas, made it safe for General Granger to come in there. Because as we know, army generals, don't fight no battles. They're sitting back miles and miles from the battlefront, okay, before they come in. 
So General Granger could come in <laughs> in June. That's why it's called Juneteenth. Okay. So again, from uh, uh, late April, all of May, and middle of June, these 10,000 black soldiers occupied Galveston, occupied Texas, and dismantled the Confederate you know, hierarchy and, 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 and soldiers and made it safe for General Granger to come in there on his boat, on his horseback, and say, okay, okay, <laughs> we can now proclaim uh, that the, uh, the proclamation issued in 1863 has meaning now. But he didn't say, hey, you black folk, hey, you white folk, it's these brothers right here that kicked Lee's butt that forced his surrender. And we are here because, and we're thankful that these troops and the introduction of 200,000 black men and women is what made it possible for me to be here and issue that this proclamation for emancipation can now be upheld. So it's my belief. Yes, I um, honor the city of Covington for taking this step uh, as a city government to uh, uh, proclaim, uh, to announce, to declare, uh, to honor Juneteenth. But I question the narrowness to say it's about developing the local economy. It's about diversity. Uh, it's about inclusion. Yeah, it's all that. Yeah, it includes that. But that's when you think Juneteenth is only a holiday for African-Americans. Because Granger went in and proclaimed, you, you Black folk are free. Again, it's my position, and I ask you all to think about this, it's my position that Juneteenth symbolizes this furthering of this struggle, this work, this movement to perfect the democracy. And Juneteenth was also proclaiming to the whole world. It didn't just proclaim to the United States. Juneteenth and the war coming to an end proclaimed to the whole world that the United States, which was a divided country for almost five years, has now been reunited, reconnected. Maybe we should call ourselves the re-United States of America. <laughs> that's, what, that's kind of what we really are, okay? We got reunited, reconnected. And I think that we should be within local government and within other entities around Juneteenth, we should broaden that narrative away from it being, oh, it's about, that holiday is about uh, black people who were, let's say enslaved or slaves uh, being free. It's you all's cultural uh, pastime, okay? You, you gather together, you celebrate, you have big meals, you have music celebration. Yes, we do all that. We should keep doing all that. But Juneteenth and the Civil War coming to an end was this reuniting of the North and the South together so we could continue on in our work and our effort as citizens, as government to perfect the democracy. In my view, that was Juneteenth, perfecting the democracy. So thank you for listening. Bye, y'all.